Hi, I'm Arlene McIntyre, Creative Director at Ventura Design, and you're listening to Shut the Front Door, a lighthearted podcast that will bring you through the front door and into the homes of influential and interesting people. Home for me is one of the most important things in my life. My career has fortunately given me the opportunity to work closely with people and to help them create a home they will cherish forever. Today on Shut the Front Door, we are overjoyed to be joined by the phenomenal world-renowned designer, Cloda. Founder and CEO of the company that carries her name, Cloda has won numerous international awards in her career and was introduced to Interior Design Magazine's Hall of Fame in 1997. Cloda passionately believes that good design supports well-being and that it can transform people's lives. The experience of entering a Cloda design space is one of blissful serenity. Cloda's work is featured across many global publications, including the New York Times, Forbes magazine, and the Wall Street Journal. Her portfolio is a treasure trove of the most amazing designs in hospitality, private residences, and spas globally. Cloda's work can also be seen in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, where she was invited to design the furniture collection for the Modern Terrace. Cloda travels the world for business and inspiration. An advocate for education and well-being, she tirelessly supports organizations fostering education in the developing world, including the Thorn Tree Project and Animal Welfare via Ape Action Africa. Originally from County Mayo and currently based in New York City, Cloda has set the international design world alight with her distinct and recognizable style. Described as a modern design icon, Cloda was one of the earliest adopters of feng shui in her design practice and is once again ahead of the curve with her use of cutting edge modalities such as chromotherapy and biophilia in her projects. Acclaimed designer, author, wife, mother to three sons and adored grandmother. I am so excited to welcome Cloda to shut the front door. Thank you. I'm delighted to be invited here. So I am very excited to chat with you today. and I've been following your career for so many years now, and I have loads of questions in store for you. I'll try to answer most of them, and sometimes I might say no. <laughs> That's fine, too. That's fine, too. So, Cloda, I'd love to chat with you, if I may, about your first memories of home. Can you share some of those memories with me? Well, it's really a question of homes because um, I moved five times before I was 16 because we came from a downwardly mobile family. (laughs) So um, I was born in County Mayo in Oscar Wilde's country home, Moitura House, and then we moved to Sligo, and then we moved to Meath, and then we would move to, and then we moved to, to um, Wicklow and, and Dublin, in the middle of which I was packed off to boarding school. Um, so it was, uh, it was, um, it was interesting actually because um, there was a lot of moving vans involved in my early life. You know? <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I think that has had a strong effect on my current uh, minimalistic approach to have everything that you need and nothing more than what you need. Yeah. And why why did your family move so much? Was it work related? No, no, it wasn't. It was uh, it was uh, it was old family living living on no money and with um, and and a great scandal which I won't go into. Okay. Well, I just I tell you actually what happened was my father eloped with his son's fiance, and there was huge family up, uproar, and everybody was cut off. Wow. My part of the family was cut off. This was before I was born, of course, but but it continued, you know, through my childhood. My gosh, goodness me. Yeah. How did that impact you as a child? You, you must have. That must have been a, a stressful environment for you. Well, it was. Uh, which I didn't know until I was. I was uh, actually. 18. I didn't know about it, but I did know that we weren't allowed to invite people home and stuff like that very much. And we were sent to separate boarding schools. My gosh, that sounds like a, like a novel. Like, you, you, you know, it sounds like something you'd read about. That's that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah it, 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 totally, it, to, it totally is. You know, it's a, it's a really, I've had a very episodic life, a lot of, lot of changes and, uh, and I like change. It's good. Yeah, it is good. It is very good. So did your, in all the homes that you lived in, did your family have a particular style? My family had a style of um, entailed antiques, entailed mm-hmm. silver, and uh, getting sold off bit by bit so that the kids could be sent to boarding schools. 
And what was boarding school like for you? Well, I was sent to Alexandra in Dublin. And um, it was it was interesting because it, it was uh, also had ch- ch- children of um, people from various embassies. So it was it was it was my first, as it were, introduction to international, you know, that people of different colors and so on. And that was good. And it was also a very challenging school that they, they uh, every week you, you had a, given a place in the class. And I was always neck and neck with another woman called Judy Nelligan. I don't know if she's still around. She's listening. Um, and one of us would be first one week and the, the next week. And so it was like two racehorses challenging each other. I wonder if she is listening in. Judy, Judy Nelligan. And do you feel that you, you came from a creative family? My mother was um, an interesting woman. She's um, a French Huguenot um, extraction. And... Um, she she was uh, she was an artist and she also used to ride point to point side saddles. So she was also a horsewoman. Wow! And she was the, one of the first women in Ireland to give a one man show in Galway. <laughs> Say one woman, but it's always known as a one man show, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but she that was that was actually stamped out by the time I came, by the time I came along. But she uh, she encouraged me to draw and paint. And um, did horses, like the world of horses, play a big part in your life and in your family? Well, at first, in, uh, first was the world of dogs because my father bred dogs. He bred gun dogs, uh, retrievers, pointers, red setters, you name it. And so there was always a c- kind of a c- c- cacophony of bark surrounding us. And on the aga cooker, there was always a giant pot of livers and lights for the dog food. Disgusting. Things. I think looking back, that probably is what made me a vegan. <laughs> but the horses, the horses didn't come in until, until our third house when we were in Navin. My mm-hmm. father brought me a pony that I thought was very ugly. <laughs> he had a kind of crop mane and, and he had a he, he just wasn't my girl dream of a horse you know with flowing mane and tail but then he bought me another horse um, who was too big for me actually and gilded very late and saddle shy so actually uh, that horse is got what got me into my first career because he threw me on the saddle he bucked so hard that the straps of the girth broke and I flew onto hard ground and broke my back so I was on my back for months Oh, my gosh. And when I was on my back, um, my father had also had design careers for everybody. And I was to teach classics and mathematics in Trinity. That was, my, that was going to be my career. But I was lying on my back because my mother decided to take me home rather than put me in hospital on my back for months. Yeah. She decided to home nurse me. So I was looking at the Irish Times one day. I could only hold it up above my head. And I saw an ad, why not be a dress designer? And I had that moment and I thought, well, why not? So uh, when I was up and walking, I told my mother, and she said, I don't know what your father will say, because my father was always referred to as your father. <laughs> no. mm-hmm. uh, but she said, I'll help you if that's what you want to do. And when my father found out, he kicked me out of the house. <gasps> he said, nobody in our family goes into trade. I mean, that's, how, that's what it was like. Wow. So my mother gave me 400 pounds and I, I went to um, the pattern cutting school, the Grafton Academy, uh, for, for a few weeks. And, and then I opened my own business on South Ann Street with the, the money my mother had given me. My gosh, that's I, so I, interesting. I, I was 17. Um, this, will, this, this will amuse you. I knew nothing about business, money, nothing. And um, I had to open a bank account, so I did that. And a couple of months in, maybe about six months in, my bank manager called me and said, uh, Claude, I would really like to see your books. So didn't I trot down to the to the bank <laughs> with the books I was reading? <laughs> and says, <laughs> the innocence. Mr. Mooney, why do you want to know what I'm reading? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that is so wonderful! And what did he say? Did he did he laugh? Did he? Oh, he he laughed himself sick. Oh, that is the best. That is so funny. The innocence. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I mean, innocent. We were brought up boarding school, home, very strict. There's nothing stricter than an Irish Protestant upbringing, in my opinion. And boarding school, church three times on Sunday. Wow, that's heavy. Yeah. 
and uh, like uh, life literally threw you in another direction though yes exactly and can you remember the unit that you were working in can you remember on south down street what what number was over your door I was um, Radio Television Aaron is just doing doing a documentary on my life. Yeah. And um, I think it's 22 South Ann Street, but I'm hopeless on numbers. And and uh, I can add up in my head, but I'm hopeless on remembering numbers. But it was the coffee inn was on one side of the street and, and wine and David Wine and Cheeks. And I was on the other side of the street on the second floor. That's what I remember. Gosh. I also, I also remember, because I was so young, um, when I'd hung out my, my little sign, uh, this, a woman walked up the stairs and knocked on my door and I opened it and she said, I'd like to speak to the, to the designer. And I said, well, I'm the designer. And she said, you look very young. How old are you? And I said, 17. And she said, I'll come back when you have some experience. And I had one of the worst hissy fits I've had in my life, stamping my feet. I, I realized you should never tell anybody how old you are because you're either going to be too young or too old. Very true. Yeah. That's so true. And really, age doesn't matter. It's about your passion and your spirit and, you know, all those things, your gifts and talents. And is there any one piece of furniture that has ever, that's stayed in in any of your homes from your childhood? None. None. No, it stayed, it stayed it, one, a couple of pieces stayed when we, when, uh, when I got married and, and moved into Bowen House in Dublin. Um Two Jimmy Hicks side tables, um, an Irish Chippendale sideboard, and an Irish hunting table. They oh. stayed with me, and they, they, I think my, my, the Jimmy Hicks side table had been made for my mother's family on commission, and the other pieces came from my father's family. My father was born in Fermoy, my mother in, in Nobber. Okay. So they, you had a very strict upbringing, obviously. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that didn't crush your creativity at all. Well, no, because you see, the thing is this, that, um, you know, between the dogs and the horses and everything, and I was out and about a lot, walking, riding, riding, walking, um, and the, the, the whole spirit of Ireland um, and the colors and the, and the changing light and shadows, the ephemera of it really entered my soul. And it's in my inner video. You know, I can still walk down in front of Bowman House. I can still walk up the fields in Navan. <laughs> I can still bike to school in the boat. You know, I have the, I have all that. Mm, yes. That's an amazing thing about the brain, really, is, is the amount of information it carries in this minuscule three and a half pound or whatever it is thing we have between our ears. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and, and how you can literally transport yourself into different memories and relive, you know, certain events in your life. Yeah, I call it my inner video. I carry it with me everywhere. So, for instance, when I get a new project in a country that are a state that I've been in, I can I can run my video. Your inner video. That's hilarious. If I haven't been there. We do something in our studio called wet sponge, dry sponge. A pair of us will get on a plane to go wherever it is, absolutely open, and, and roam around in that country to, to pick up the... Uh, atmosphere the you know the music all all the senses all the all the materials so that we can interpret it to when it with for our project and you describe that as wet sponge or dry sponge yeah wet sponge we go out we go out dry sponge we come back wet sponge excellent i call it wet sponge you know we're, we're working in, in argentina and bariloche and uh, we, the client flew us out, and we we roamed around the, the you know the the high the high desert and the lakes and everything, and you know we looked at the tr- crafts and we listened to the music, and so it, 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 it's uh, being a designer, I think, is being in a sense like being a travel guide also. Mm-hmm. Um, a good travel guide takes you to places you've heard about, but a really good travel guide will take you to places you might not even have thought of going to or known about. Exactly. That's so interesting. I love that. So when did your passion for interiors begin? Well, I had my passion, uh, passion in Dublin. I had the, that went on for a while and I had three boys and um and then I changed husbands, countries, and careers. <laughs> okay, so when did you, at what point then did you move again? 
So I, I, what I did is I went to New York and then I moved to Spain. I was in Spain for seven, lived in Spain for seven years, and that's because that's where I, having 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 left the fashion, that's where I became um, a designer of uh, of living spaces. Mm-hmm. I don't like saying I'm an interior designer. It's, it's uh, I don't like confines putting put on me um, because I work with landscaping and, you know, we're working at the moment with music for somebody for a brand that we're working with. So when you walk into the space, there's going to be music that will make people remember the brand and they're in your video. Yes. Yeah. So you're kind of open to really anything in many, many ways. You have many, many talents. Totally. And the nice thing, although sometimes I, I feel that the imposter syndrome because I've had no really formal education, um, certainly not. I've had a lot of experience, but no formal ed- education. I don't know what the rules are, so I don't know if I'm breaking them or not. <laughs> it allows me to think more freely. Yeah, that's that's true. That's really, really true. And also what I do is, is I hire people that are better than I am because that way, I, you know, I can I can get guidance from people who are really experienced and really trained. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, you're self-taught, if you like. As, as, as my husband and I like to say, self-taught by an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but you've definitely been to the School of Life, Plota, from the sounds of it. Oh, I have, yes. I've had... Uh, yeah, and more. I mean, you, you work very much off your instincts, obviously. Well, it, it's... Uh, it's. Uh, I, I try to interpret. Um, I, I try to go beyond the physical and make the phys- the, the the invisible tangible in a sense. Because we work with feng shui and biogeometry and other healing arts that make people feel better in the spaces we design. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm fascinated by feng shui. I just think that's a really interesting subject. I read on your website that growing up in the depths of the country in Ireland left you fascinated by light, fragrance and shadows. Absolutely. Do you feel, do you feel that this was the spark that ignited your passion for creativity and design? I don't think, I don't think there's any one spark. I, I, one of the main things that, uh, that, that, that uh, Ireland taught me is, is the use of light. I always remember driving down in County Kerry and just seeing a, a lone ram standing on top of a vast rock in, in, uh, in a, on a gloomy, cloudy day, and suddenly a ray of sun hit him. And it was like what we call it, we call it the Jehovah light. <laughs> no. Yes. So that taught me to light what's light about lighting. We, we work very tightly with the really good lighting designers. And understanding light and capturing it and yeah. probably how to harness light as well in the best how way. To harness light and also to light with shadows, not to not just to think of light, but, but to light with shadows, to create shadows. Yes. I've watched your YouTube video with um, Restoration Hardware. I just love it. I think it's so it's so beautifully done. Oh, I'd forgotten that. <laughs> I know, and you talk about that as well in that yeah. in that video. So yeah, it really no, made I, me think about light in a different way. You know, the shadows. You just don't often think about shadows. No, it's, no, it's the shadows that really, in a sense, uh, make the light shine. You know, that's so true. Yeah, yeah. It's, you need one. The contrast. Yeah, it's a, the shadows are a stage for light in a sense. Yes, indeed. And you you opened Clota Design in 1983 in New York. That's right. Yeah. And so what ultimately made you decide to go stateside? Oh, actually, what happened was um, I opened my um, design business in uh, Spain. We lived in a little town called Almeria on the Mediterranean coast. Um, and we had a townhouse and we had a farm up on the hills and a, and a, and a lovely little house in a, in a village about an hour's drive away. And... Um, as I said, I started my business there. Again, accidental. Not because I'd had an accident, but because uh, when I went to Spain, I didn't speak Spanish. And my husband is trilingual. So I said to him, we bought this townhouse, a very rundown townhouse. And, and uh, I said to my husband, look, why don't I take care of this? Why do you develop your business? We, he was developing a, a resort. And um, I realized that um, it was very exciting to me to move walls and to light and to do color and 
bring in uh, artifacts and so on and weave them into a project. And there was a retail space at the b- bottom of the house, the old square. So my husband came home one day and I said, um, you know what? I think I want to take the space downstairs and continue to continue doing what I'm doing now. Forget fashion totally. So the day I hung out my shingle again, somebody came to the door. And I opened the door and he said, you know, because I, I hung out a sign saying Clota interior, you know, in architecture or something like that. And um, he said, are you the English designer? And I said, and I, I, I'm looking for somebody to design my English pub. And I said, no, I'm the Irish designer, but I'll design your pub. So he hired me. <laughs> no, I don't know how to design pubs. There's no Irish in them. That's what I'll say. <laughs> so I designed. I, I designed his. Uh, I designed his pub, and then I designed his restaurant, and then I designed his architect's house, and then it went on from there. My gosh! So that was a big break for you. Yes, it's it's um it's um and most of my big breaks have been through, you know through people like that because when I then when I came to the states I um. I was walking down Madison Avenue, and uh, I don't know if you know a poster called The Doors of Dublin. No. So, well, in The Doors of Dublin, the Irish poster. Yes. There's one small boy, my son, standing, Peter, who was just talking to you, standing in my doorway, says Cloda, on 62 Lower Bagot Street. I remember that number. And the photographer who was doing the uh, Doors of Dublin uh, was walking down Madison Avenue, and we ran into each other, and he said, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I've just, I've just moved here. Uh, he said, what are you doing? Well, I said, I think I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing in Spain. I'm designing houses and restaurants and hotels and stuff like that. And without a beat, he said, would you design my apartment for me? Wow. And I said, how can you say that, Bob? I mean, you don't even know what I do. He said, well, I was in your house in Dublin. I loved it. So I was off and running. And so I designed his um, every, everything I can think of for him. And then uh, I got I got some uh, other jobs, really big jobs. I say totally one of them from standing at a bar, actually, hearing an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> and saying, "What's the decent Irish boy doing at a at a, at a at a New York bar?" And the guy turned around to me and said, "Well, I'm opening opening offices here." I said, "Well, I'm a good Irish woman. I'll design them for you." And lo and behold, I got them. Wow! <laughs> that was called oh. speed aviation. <laughs> Incredible timing, like the timing of your life. Yes, I know it's weird. It is. It's a. It's truly amazing. It's like you were destined to meet all these people. It's like it was mapped out for you. Yeah, exactly. All you have to do, all you have to do is follow the path, right? Yeah. If you if you are open to following the path, I think that's when the magic really begins, you know, when you're open. Well, I'm open to anything. Yes. Yes, it does sound that way. You're 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 very inspiring. Um what do you have happening in Ireland at the moment? Well, um I believe this is going to happen. Uh, there's going to be um, a museum for the boats in in Kong for the sunken boats. They're going to be brought up from the from uh, from the, the depths of Loch Corrib, and it's going to be tied in with um, with uh, the famous pirates, the famous female pirates. They're Bronze Age boats, long oak canoes. And some, for some reason, there's something at the silt in Loch Corrib that preserved the boats. Um, and we hope to we hope to hope to start on the museum soon. Actually, in Kong. My goodness, the Kong is beautiful. Have you have you um, spent much time there? Well, as a child, obviously, because that's where Moitura House is, was situated between Cross and Kong and Ashford Castle. Yes. Yeah. So absolutely, and I love Kong, and I love the meeting of the waters there. It's a very magical place. It's it's a, it's a vortex, definitely. It definitely is. And do you remember Ashford Castle way back when? Do you feel it's changed a lot over time? Well, as children, we were sometimes brought over there the, 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 uh, the, I think it was the Guinnesses who had it then um, and uh, but but all these all these stately Irish homes are uh, they're very inspiring for me yeah you know, really you know Robert O'Byrne yes you know, I, of course I follow him <laughs> and actually he put me on his in his book on Irish fashion wow well I was uh, I don't know if you've ever been in Bally Finn have you I, heard of Bally Finn it's a beautiful beautiful country estate here in Ireland. It's actually in Port Leash, but it's it's magnificent. It would be um, one to visit the next time you're coming to Ireland. I shall make I shall make a note of that. I 
I may have been, I have to tell you, I have a dreadful memory for names. Yes. <laughs> no sense of direction. <laughs> no. It doesn't seem I, that way, though. I do love, uh, I particularly liked, actually, the, uh, I think one of the most inspiring things for me has been the basements in the stately homes, the way they have the laundry set up so beautiful, you know, with the railings, the drying rails and the racks and everything like that. The yes. Order, it, the stately order of it is very inspiring. Yeah, true, true. But there was I, teams of people working in these homes, you know, once upon a time. No, I they know. Were, they were run like businesses. Below stairs and above stairs. Yeah. 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 It's really, really fascinating. No, exactly. And gardeners and everything and the pecking order. I mean, Downton Abbey, Irish style. Exactly. And so what else do you have happening in Ireland? Well, um, I may be getting a spa to do. A nice big spa. I'm waiting to hear. I did the spa in Dune Beg. I don't know if you yes, knew that. I did. Yeah. White Horses Spa. That was kind of fun. I mean, it's, it, for me, working in Ireland is a dream. I did my son's house with him um, in, in Cork. It's called the Cow House. It's an old, it's an old stone cow house that we converted. And that was one, that was most, one of the most fun projects I've worked on. And tell me a little bit about that project. Well, we decided we decided the family was all over the place. You know, my son, this particular one, was in the west coast of the states at this time. Peter was in Ireland. I was in the east coast of the states, um, and then Danielle's daughter, my son's daughter, and so on. We decided, but anyway, the Irish side of the family decided it would be nice to have a place that we could all go to and have and meet from time to time as a family. And uh, they asked me to describe since. I I was the designer one, uh, what kind of a house I'd like. And I said, I'd love an old stone barn or something on an old estate, you know, so you have the past there and so on and so forth. And they drove around for a while. And one day they emailed me in New York and said, I think we found it. So it was a, an old stout stone cow house. It still had the cow buyer down the middle. It still it was had several layers of cow excrement. <laughs> oh, dear. Almost roofless, but uh, just in the perfect space, you know, just up on a hill looking over the old head of Kinsale, Garrettstown, you know. It was the most beautiful place, so I flew over and had a look at it, and we decided to go ahead and do it. Wonderful. As a family reunion place, but then the son that was on the West Coast decided he wanted to live there himself, so... So then he built it, a little house called the Tigine for, for visiting family in the organic garden. <laughs> that sounds wonderful, though. No, it's lovely. It's lovely. Oh, gosh. And do you yeah. get to visit it much? Yeah, I'm just back from I was there in, in uh, actually, I was in there for, in November for the, for the uh, documentary. And then I did a house on, on Millionaire's Row in Dorky. Oh, wow. Yeah. What was that like? Oh, it's a be- beautiful house. I mean, it was it was like on a clear day, you could see Liam Neeson kind of thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was great fun, actually. I enjoyed that. Yeah, that's an interesting area. I mean, you've got, yeah. you have the uh, the singer and the, the uh, Anya, you might have heard of her. She's yes. very talented. You've got Bono. You've got a really, yeah, a really interesting handful of people out that way. Yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a, lo- a lovely place. When we were when when I was still in Ireland and we were going to hot balls and dancing all night, we instead of going to bed, we'd go down to, to, to the beach at Dorky. I remember and watch the sun come up. It's so beautiful there, though. It's a really lovely village and it's a nice spot too. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, just Dorky yeah. Island is really really beautiful. Yeah, and you could, of course, see it from the house. So, I mean, I love, I love, I love Ireland. I mean, I carry it deep in my heart. And do you think Ireland has changed much over the years? Uh, well, thank God the sense of humour hasn't changed. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because, um, I adore good puns. <laughs> no, no. And uh, when I was, when, when I was uh, at the house in Dublin and, and my three boys and, and the Irish husband, I remember you didn't really invite anybody to a dinner table unless they were interesting. Yeah. Or could tell a good story, you know? Yeah. I think it's still the same thing a little bit, although I'm afraid the, the I'm afraid the IT world have, may have undermined a lot of the a lot of dialogue, interesting dialogue. Yeah, it it has unfortunately, and and there's a lot of mobiles in restaurants, and the art of conversation has been yeah, it's it's almost like it's fading away, sadly. 
yeah, it's, it's really been undermined. I was at, I was at just before COVID started, I was in, at dinner in a really nice restaurant in, in New York. And there were, there were 10 people at a table. It was a big table. And I swear it was a noisy restaurant because one of my bet noir is, uh, is sound. When you go, go to a restaurant, you can't have a conversation if you want, even if you want one. But I swear to God, all of the people at that table were on their, on their uh, handhelds. That's on their, terrible. On their devices. Yeah, that's not good. Hopefully well, in the future, there'll be like a no mobile policy in some of these restaurants, you know, where people have to speak to each other and, and enjoy their food. Well, I, I, I have a great desire to, um, to, to, have, to, to design a restaurant which is so acoustically balanced and with uh, and devices banned. <laughs> so, no, no. Yeah. So, a conversation. I thought I'd call the restaurant talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's genius. I love it. I will be going there. Okay. Well, that's that's, that's excellent. Listening to this will have you design the restaurant. That is <laughs> such a cool idea. I love it. Calling it talk as well. That's just genius. Um, but you created the concept behind Elizabeth Arden's Red Door salons and spas throughout the U.S. Yes, I'm very often asked to interpret brands because for me, a brand is like a personality. Yes. So I, I, I rebranded, uh, I helped to rebrand Elizabeth Arden. And mm-hmm. I also have done it with um, a company called Six Senses. I don't know if you know Six Senses Worldwide, spas and resorts. Yes. And uh, I rebranded Miraval. In fact, I do a lot of it because I, t- I take I take the uh, I take the uh, I, I take the, the project as though I'm creating an, a new entity. You know. Yeah. Or I'm doing if I'm if I'm creating something which is going to roll out. I also treat it as an entity. So you look at the project in a total like a holistic way. Totally. I look at everything holistically. Like there's no point in if you're looking at, say, for example, a hotel project, only focusing on the bar and the lounge. You probably have to holistically examine it, you know, from the front door, what the impression is from the front door in. Yeah, exactly. It's from arrival to uh, what happens when you get your room. Uh, we have we we have tried to design our rooms so you can put away everything neatly within 12 minutes. <laughs> open your suitcase, put everything away and yeah. order a room service, you know? Yeah, nice. No, I yeah. feel that, I feel that uh, curating design is, is as important as, cre- as, as um, creating design. Yes. yes. I, I say we design experiences, actually. You design experiences. That's yes, exactly. wonderful. You should coin that. That's really good. And how did you find working through the recent pandemic? Was there anything that you felt uh, changed your business? It's been for me. It's and I'm very much a people person, and mm-hmm. I like I, I'm very much a team person. So I like to have the team around the table, and, and the do I call them the dooms of zooms, <laughs> or, or get to me sometimes. You know, that you're just, just sitting there. You haven't got. You can't. You know. You can't you know, scrub, draw over drawings and on the doom of zooms. You can, but no, but it, it's in a techie way. So I, yes. find, I find that a bit challenging. And um, and what's happened? We've got more business in a sense we ever had because, of course, what I, I told you about my talk about it takes a virus. What's happened? The virus has raised people's consciousness to the need for well-being and personal care, and we've always stood for well-being. I mean, I was the same in fashion. Your clothes had to breathe. Your clothes had to walk, move with you. You know, when I was yes. in fashion, and, and natural fabrics as far as possible. You know, so uh, so it's 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 difficult just to continue that theme remotely. But I'm doing it, and uh, everybody's everybody's uh, excited about well being now. For sure. And going and going green, going green exactly. But I was excited about well-being when I was a child in uh, in Moitura in in, uh, in 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 Mayo and then in in Sligo and, and in Navan because um, I watched my father feeding his dogs and training them. I watched the horses being fed and how if the horse was fed too heavily on grass, it wouldn't make a jumping champion. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I. I've always been interested in uh, 
in health. And if the animals could perform better if they're fed the right way, I thought, why not apply this to human beings? Are we doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so I was the youngest child, and um, I was nearly three years younger than my brother. My sister was five years older. So I was very observant, you know, definitely observing what was going on. And then you apply that to your work. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so even with our sofas, uh, we design or, or specify, we do what we call the flop test. You stand with your back to the sofa and you let yourself go. And, and, and <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And if the sofa doesn't give you a hug, it's not your sofa. <laughs> I love that. Oh, my God. And I also feel that your home should give you a hug. It should be like a big hug. Absolutely. It should be your nanny. Yeah. Yes, it should take care of you. It should. And it just really should be there for you to to restore yourself and to take care of yourself and be happy and all those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And can I ask you, how did your collaboration with Restoration Hardware come about? I mean, that's like an extraordinary opportunity. They're really big hitters in the business. Yeah. They, oh, no, they just, uh, they just asked me. And I wow. said, it was like they asked me and I said, yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, they're so interesting. Their growth is also phenomenal. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're really, uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary company. Um, it's it's so it's so well curated actually restoration hardware you you hardly need a designer and of course now they have designers you know that you can hire designers through them and that's that really is a great service because i think really that everybody has their own good taste i find you know if i take somebody to to uh, out and just let them let them think and uh, absorb what they're looking at in the showrooms and so on. They'll almost inevitably go to where I, th- I thought they might. I would might want them to go. I mean, because they chose me and I have a certain look, let's say, or feeling. I think everybody, everybody just needs a good interpreter. Yes. Yeah. And do you carefully select the projects you take on, Clodagh, or how does that process work for you? Um, it, it, the process works for me usually that um, I, I, uh, there's projects I might not want to take and there's projects that I would love to have that I've never had like I'd love to design a museum you know and you know stuff like that <laughs> we're doing we're doing a, we've just not just done but just before COVID we did a multi-family building in Queens it's 1700 and, I say 1752 apartments I think Huge with the thirty thousand square foot um, amenities, with indoor outdoor pool and all this stuff, and that was that was absolutely thrilling. It was uh, because we're art consultants as well, so we were able to select very interesting art. Wow! And uh, how many people do you have working within your team? Well, within our team at the moment, we're we're sixteen. And we have um, we have a team. I would call, call them a team. We have consultants we've worked with for years, like our lighting consultants. You know, we we have um, engineers we've worked with. We've got custom furniture, custom lighting. You know, all that the people that we work with. So it's actually it's actually um, they they know me so well. It's almost they can interpret for me. And then of course we did the buying offices and so on. You know that we that we. That's are selected for the big for the big buildings. Yes, we've got a lot on at the moment. Actually, we're working, I think, in about four countries, five countries. I don't know. My gosh, how exciting! Yeah, no, it, it really is. I, I love to travel. Yeah, and how how important is it uh, for you to get to know your clients before you start working with them on their project? Do you believe that it's very important to know the person behind the project? Not only do I think it's important to know the person behind the project, but I ask for the horoscope sign of each person that comes in to me as a new client. I have to say, Clodagh, that I do that too. Yeah. And I, I think that is so fascinating about you. And I remember some. I, I do that and I get teased about it all the time and people think I'm nuts, but I do. And then somebody said, but did you know that Clodagh does that? And I thought, well, there you go. <laughs> because if you, if you have a bunch of suits that come in, you know, colors and tie and ties, and you ask them, you can see them. <laughs> I know they're squirming around in their chairs. They're like, "Oh God, what's going on here?" There's a funny, there's a funny thing. My husband used to be a movie director and screenwriter and so on, and he said, "There's uh, something you do with movies, you know, particularly funny movies." You have a scene earlier on that that is very funny, and that gives people permission to laugh. So we're very light. Yeah, we're we're very light with our, our meetings. 
we quip and pun and, and enjoy and laugh. Yes. And like you need to kind of relax people into it because I think, you know, the subject, the whole thing about, you know, starting a big project, that's something you're doing every day, but for, perhaps for the client it's not. And they can be very nervous and it's just. Well, yeah, because they're handling, they're handling the money. You know, very often you have the money guys there. And we, we, we you know, they, they, I believe that the human contact, you know, is so important. And if we're doing it, if we're doing a job that's like a multifamily building, you know, or like the hotel in, in, in Argentina, are we, are we expanding, for instance, in Portugal for, for the six senses? I like to have all the people I can around, put around a table, around the table at the beginning of the job so you can actually look each other in the eye. Yeah. It's become a little difficult, to say the least, with COVID, but we're yeah. doing our best, you know? Yes, 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 yes. And is there a star sign that you prefer to work with? And is there a star sign that you don't like to work with? I use my knowledge of the, of the sign that uh, I'm working with simply to, uh, it's, it, as the, I think the Dalai Lama said, it's not the car, it's who's driving it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if I know what what their tendencies are, it just makes it easier for me to handle them. So it's it's not a question of choice at all. I wouldn't choose one necessarily over another. What are you? What are you, by the way? I'm a Capricorn, but I have a Leo rising sign, which loosens me up, thankfully. And I have Virgo in my moon. <laughs> no. <laughs> So you're, you're very organized. Yeah, sometimes. And how about you? I'm a Libra with a touch of Capricorn. Are you? Is your Capricorn on the rising or on, on the sun? The, the Capricorn kind of keeps me in line. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> and it's taught me how to say no. <laughs> I know, I know. The Capricorn's good. It can steady you up, actually, for sure. But um, I'm glad. I'm really glad to have the Leo in my mix, for sure. And you're lucky to have Libra. Yeah, I know. It's, it's great because uh, it, it makes conflict resolution very easy for me. Yeah, that's true. I, and had, you- I had a wonderful incident in my studio. There were about 26 people around, around our conference table. And um, a, a polemic started. They were, they were really, really, one of the guys was really at the other guy, hammer and tongs, and it was upsetting the whole meeting. And one of our staff, an architect, had a tiny puppy <laughs> and he didn't, he had the puppy in the office that day so I listened to it all and I just took went over to his desk took the puppy and put the puppy on the conference table <laughs> and it was the funniest thing oh yeah you got to see my dog yeah I've got a dog too <laughs> it was so totally diffused everything yeah and you all had the, that moment in uh, you know uh, in time in common really yeah that's so, so cute. Everyone loves a puppy. Yeah. Are you a spiritual person, Clota? Would you describe yourself as a spiritual person? Well, do I live in my head or do I live beyond my head? Do you live beyond your head? I live beyond my head, yeah. And do you pick up on energy from certain people or projects that you've worked on? Yeah, I do, yeah. it's uh, some, Sometimes it's um, my one of my sons used to call me the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> 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 so I pick up energy, but I mean good energy from some, from some of the projects. And in some projects, you're, there's, a, there's heavy energy and I have to keep working it up. Yeah, yeah. So you're a little clairsentient perhaps yeah does your own private home reflect your professional style not really because it's an old house and i'm in many ways and i'm yes i would i'm conserving it i'm trying to keep it together it's um i'm building a glass dining room onto it which is like a box which is going which is more who i am looking yes. at looking out over the river and your philosophy is life enhancing minimalism yes yeah and how have you been this way your entire life? Yeah, kind of. But I find that uh, the the COVID move because I moved out of my apartment in New York and and decided to uh, commute. I can the, the conflation of the house and the apartment in New York took me a while to get rid of all the things I needed to get rid of because there's not only one person living in this house. There's the husband. <laughs> Also, I've got New Year's resolutions every year, and one of them, and one last year's one is to give one thing away a day. I love that. And this this year's one is do what you can't do. 
And do you still give one thing away every day? Yeah. That's tough. It's not, actually. That's the funny part of it. And and what could that be? Could that be anything? It could be a piece, piece of clothing. It could be some money. It could be uh, it, it could be some time. Um, you know, time, the, yeah. Yeah, it could be, could be anything. It could be a number of things. Gosh, I must try that. That's a good one. Well, actually, it's it's not it's nice. I, I I have I have a quote actually that I love and I try to live by. I'll read it to you if you like. Okay. Happy to read yes, it. please. The ancient Egyptians believed that upon death they would be asked two questions, and their answers would determine whether they could continue their journey in the afterlife. The first question was, "Did you bring joy?" The second was, "Did you find joy?" Oh. And how would you answer those two questions? By trying to bring joy and, trying yes. to, and finding joy, joy and, and, you know, cel- a celebration and also trying to bring joy to others, either, you know, through my work or whatever it is. That's that's lovely. And do you find that you 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 get energized and really happy when you're giving? You know, the whole act of giving and receiving. It's just like yeah, a certain yeah, the act of giving, and of course, being given too is lovely too. You know. Yes. Yes. When you know, it's when somebody gives you something, and and you know by what you're being given that they know you. <laughs> That's true too, and that they've spent that time to think about you and to yes. give you something, and it's the thought really. It's that's very important. I think what we all need is acknowledgement of who we are, recognition of who we are, yeah. and recognizing others for who they are. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes I slip. <laughs> no, we all slip. Yes. And uh, out of curiosity, Clodagh, did you ever have a mentor yourself in the world of interiors? Well, when I was in fashion, Jack Clark was very nice to me and Irene Gilbert because that, that was the days of fashion then. Mm-hmm. Sybil Connolly, Irene Gilbert, you know, Ib Jorgensen. But again, recognizing what I was doing. Actually, I just saw Ib in, in Ireland. <laughs> they brought him in for the documentary. Oh, wow. Fabulous. I, loved, I know. It was lovely. I really love him. I admire him. Yeah. And uh, then when... In Spain, I, I, I had to be more or less my own mentor. And then I, then I got somebody, I opened a little shop called Trastos, uh, celebrating local arts and crafts and antiques. So I could use, and also I could, and artists, so I could use the stuff to, you know, to, to uh, furnish and, and, and hang art on the wall. And I found a woman called Maria Matilde del Pino, who just loved, didn't drive a car, loved excursions. And uh, she was, she was, and uh, was also spiritual in, 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 and she used to go to Buddhist retreats in Malaga. And a friend I still have in Oaxaca, who's uh, Pat Maroney, who's also one of those people. Mm-hmm. People, like, who, people I could talk to, 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 talk to, and actually share what I'm really feeling. Yes. And then I, when I came to New York, um, there's a designer called Jack Lenore Lars, Larson, a weaver, who who. Um, I, I did some projects, you know, but I used it in heavenly silks from Thailand and wonderful natural weavings and stuff like that. I don't know if you know his work. I but, have heard of him. Mm-hmm. But, um, he, he was very, very pungent, very witty. I, I, uh, he said to me once when I started licensing my design, he said, be careful because imitation is the sincerest form of larceny. <laughs> hilarious but he was he was was very tough and um, I helped him with his longhouse out in the Hamptons and installations for him and he he was good he also told me never to take a project on unless I could make it marvellous or make money out of it good advice I know but all designers should listen to that and what does good design mean to you Clodagh? Good design means is, is somebody who uh, the other day uh, I got a, a letter from a, an email from a client and she's, she she said you can't imagine how we feel here we feel so wonderful here everywhere everywhere we everywhere we another mantra of mine is everywhere you look everywhere you walk you should see something beautiful and she actually practically echoed that in her email and yeah. that, that, that's what means something to me if not I love that sofa or that color is fabulous or anything. It's how, how clients feel in the space. Yes, yes. Bringing us back to that comment about how your home should feel like a giant hug. 
Yes, exactly. And in, if it's a multifamily building, that the public spaces should feel the same way. Mm -hmm. What's the toughest project you've ever worked on to date? Oh gosh, that's that's a tough question. Mm. I think I, I I think many of them are challenging. You know, um, I, I, but I don't I don't um, I don't I don't really seize projects like that. I just mm -hmm. get through it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not an easy industry. It's it's not an easy industry, and you can you can get some very tough people. You sure can. And I ask this question to to everybody that I that I speak with, and I'm going to ask it to you. In any given project, what proportion of your time would you say goes into the actual concept phase, if you like, the designing phase, and what proportion of time goes into the actual project management? And the I, I, I can answer that because what we say in the studio that 10% is the design and concept mm -hmm. and 90% is getting it done. That is amazing. That is amazing. I, I, I have had a lot. You're the first person to say it, say 90-10. I've had a lot of, you know, 80-20s and 70-30s, but I think I think you're right. I think it is 90-10. Yeah. And I think that's the part of the business that a lot of people don't really understand. It's it's the making it happen. It's the executing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all about the teamwork. It's tough. No, it really is. When it, it, you know, when you do, when you're doing the concept, it, it's it, that's the love affair. Yeah, exactly. It's the love right. affair. Well, who was the poet who wrote the first fine careless rapture? You know, <laughs> exactly. And everyone is friends. You know, in that ten percent bubble. You know, it's all love hearts and exciting. Yeah. But when that ninety percent is when yeah, yeah things get. Well, it's like being pregnant and. How's the baby and the diapers and the <laughs> Exactly. I honestly often say that I compare it to giving birth. It can be like actually giving birth. Yes. Like it yes. is so bloody tough, you know. Um, it's rewarding for sure. But, you know, those contractions are not great ever, actually. Well, we're, we're the people manufacturers of the world. Without us, there's no people. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And are your sons involved in your business? One, one of them is working with me on licensing. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I lost one of my sons. Oh, I'm sorry. And the other one is the other one has his own. He's kind of semi-retired now, really. And do you feel that they, they'd ever come to live here, or? Well, but the, the eldest son is the one who lives in the cow house. Yes, but do you think he'll have, like he'll stay in Ireland? Do you think that's like this is it? He'll always have a place in Ireland. Yes, and that's and, and, and in a sense that's our home base now in Ireland. That's so nice. You're so lucky. That's so lovely to have that. The door is always open there for you. Yeah, exactly. And may I ask you, where is your favorite place in your home? Where do you like to sit down, relax, restore your soul, have a cup of tea or coffee? Sometimes actually it's the kitchen. I love to cook. And uh, I was going to write a cookbook uh, called At Least You Can Eat Your Mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, love, I love cooking. I I, I love putting on Bob Marley or somebody and, and sort of move in the kitchen when I'm cooking to get some energy out, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and otherwise, sitting in front of the fire or out on the back porch, and so, shortly I hope to be in, in a glass-walled dining room looking at the snow. <laughs> oh, love it. I'd love to go to see the snow this year. Hopefully yeah. we can travel. Yeah, I love. I like snow. I love snow. We were just planning a trip to the snow actually last night. If we can safely get away, you know. It's, um, but I'd love to let. I'd love my little girl to to finally see snow. She's never been to the snow. That's so exciting. It is so exciting. Yeah, it really is. I know. I have um, between my husband and myself, we've eight grandchildren now. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, and I have a great grandchild actually in Australia. So, gosh, you really are some woman for one woman, Clodagh. Well, I, I didn't have to do the the grand the grandchild work was done by the grandchildren. <laughs> no, no, no. I know. <laughs> no. And what is your secret to life? Like, how did how have you how do you manage the whole work life balance uh, element of your life? Apart from occasional hissy fits, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> best thing I can do is walk when I'm feeling upset about something. That's one. That's my life management and meditation. Mm. 
I did transcendental meditation when I was living in Spain, and it's very, it's very useful. It's a, it's a tool, life tool. Mm-hmm. And I've, you know, I've been to, I actually, one of my favorite jobs I've done is um, Menla Mountain Retreat, which is for Tibet House. It's a retreat owned by Tibet House up in the Catskills, up in the mountains. Wonderful. And I designed the spa and I go to some of their sessions and, you know, and the Dalai Lama visited. Did you meet him? I didn't meet, I didn't meet him there, but I actually did a presentation to him in uh, Wisconsin. Wow. And what's, what was that like? And what is he like? He is very funny. <laughs> Cause is we'd, he? He'd, we'd, he'd, we'd been to Tibet. My husband and I had been to Tibet mm-hmm. and I was presenting to him what it's, it's a, a guy called Dr. Richie Davidson, who's opened a center called the center for the healthy mind. And, um, we were talking about redesigning some of the spaces to make them bring in biophilia and so on and so forth. So they asked me to make a presentation of the Dalai Lama. First and foremost, he's very funny because they, there were bodyguards up the wazoo on one side of the stage. And, <laughs> and uh, he snuck in on the other side laughing. <laughs> But anyway, when I'm presenting to him, uh, I mentioned a temple I'd been to in um, where the students come out and uh, challenge each other in the courtyard very noisily after the after the sessions. The, the, the young monks and he he raised his hand and he said, "I was a student there, very bad student," and he was laughing. <laughs> Love it. So yeah. he has a little sense of humor. He's a little... No, he doesn't have a little sense of humor. He is a very funny man. Great. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's something you just wouldn't even think of. You know, you'd think that he was a very kind of serious guy. And um, I don't know why. I just... It's humor. I wouldn't see the humor. But he does have a twinkle in his eye, actually, now that I think about it. He really is very funny. Very, very funny. Gosh. And, and pungent, too. Yes. I, yes. He, he has... I, I bought some of his teachings, you know, on, on cards, you know, and I have them on our kitchen counter. And in one of them, it says, if you feel like speaking badly about somebody, just think that you have excrement in your mouth and you won't, <laughs> it, and you won't speak badly about them anymore. That'll remind you. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. God, that's a good idea. <laughs> no, it's disgusting, but a very good idea. <laughs> it definitely would make you think. Yeah. And, and do you still love what you do as much as the day is when you started working in, in the, the world of design? Well, I, 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 even more because of the scale. Yes. I mean, I love working on a big scale because um, then, then what I do is to break down the big scale into individual experiences. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. um and it's it's uh, it's lovely. I just came back from Miami, where we're working on two different multi multifamily buildings, one rentals and one quite expensive condos. You know, and just giving the feeling of quiet luxury and place where you know where kids can play and jump, and, and we even have a, a dog spa. <laughs> I don't believe it. A dog spa. We have a dog spa in in our in the the buildings in New York that we did, and in in (laughs) Santa Monica, I was a chandelier in a dog spa because I thought it was funny. Quiet luxury. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. How would you describe that? I think it puts a smile on your face. <laughs> Particularly, by the way, if your dog has rolled in something, speaking of excrement, which dogs tend to, to be able to put him under a shower in a dog spa and kind of like clean, it, clean it smiling. <laughs> I know, but the Americans love their pets. Like I, I think when I was last in California, I saw, I switched on the television in the hotel room and they had, they had dog TV. They had like a TV station for dogs. You no, know, I didn't know that was say you're teaching me. Yes. So that those these the, the station really was set up for the dogs who are at home all day and their owners are away at work or whatever and it's to keep them amused and relaxed and Oh that's funny. I have to look that up the minute we <laughs> minute we stop talking. No. <laughs> I'm, dog suffering, TV. I'm suffering from a dog deficiency right now. I'm trying to get a dog. Oh yeah, I love I have two. I think they're important. Dogs are important. Well, I I've always had dogs, and then uh, our, our two dogs, one died after the other, and I haven't hadn't had one since, and that's about five years ago now. But it's um, I know, yeah, I, know. I, get, I have petting rights with my son's dog. <laughs> 
editing rights. Uh, wonderful. And do you feel like you need to keep it fresh, Cloda, though, generally, and just kind of switch gears every so often? And Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes. I, I, we have a country competition between us, my husband and I. He's been in 130, and I think I've been in 119 now. And <laughs> traveling and listening to different music, eating different food, looking at different culture, you know, sharing different culture. Um, you know, they have a they have a great show at the Perez Museum in Miami of, um, of uh, you know, from African African America African Americans and from uh, from all over, you know. And it's um, just seeing the way that uh, the way that, that artists from different countries, the way that seeing the different countries, seeing the world through their eyes. Yes, I think that art is. But I can get a refresh simply by walking walking around outside. Yes, yeah. But it is really interesting to see how others do do it and how they approach a project or whatever it is that they're designing. Yeah. And what you know, what inspires them and and what makes them tick. You know, it's you you always learn. It's so you're always learning. You really are. I mean, we're doing a project in uh, in Virginia, for instance, and we. We uh, some, some of the indigenous American. We're looking at we're looking at some of the tribal stuff there and seeing how we can interpret it because that's mm-hmm. one of the things in uh, biogeometry. You're selling, you're you're uh, honoring the past. I don't. You, you'll see the vast mandalas, for instance, in Miraval, which mm-hmm. are biogeometrists designed to celebrate the indigenous indigenous Americans who had lived in that area. Yes, yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, and um, what what motivates you? Like, what makes you spring out of bed in the morning? What's the uh, number one key thing that you feel motivates you each day? It's just um, I'm kind of the flow through system. Um, I get an energy rush around half past six, and feel like I feel I have to get out of bed and do something. Um, I'm very very. Uh, into healing foods and so on, so I'm very careful about what I what I cook, and uh, I, it's it, it's it, it's a compendium of things. It's not just one thing that gets me out of bed in the morning. Yes, it's uh, I have a hot shower and a cold shower. <laughs> Good. Every yep. day. Do the hokey pokey in the in the cold shower. I was taught, taught that by a doctor from Australia. He said, always have a cold shower. Right. So that's like really kind of gets the blood flowing. and Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I know. I have to do it. I was watching something, a documentary on television, and I don't know enough about it to, to get into it in detail, but they it's somewhere in Norway that they, they really think you should every day jump into you know, water that's like 20 degrees below zero or more. I think the happiest know. people in, fin- or in the world are in Finland. Some of the happiest people, and that, that's exactly what they do. And they look so well, you know, they, they just, they just never age. No, it's, it's, uh, it's a circulation thing, I think, too, you know. Yeah. So what is your morning ritual? What, what is the first thing that happens to you? You wake up in the morning, you have a hot and a cold shower, and do you have a cup of coffee? Do you have a cup of tea? Uh, well, I'm, I'm off caffeine at the moment. <laughs> We've just been through a healing plans. Okay. Uh, so uh, I plan things the night before. I plan what I'm going to make for breakfast or what my husband's going to make for breakfast. I usually have the ingredients ready. Mm-hmm. I have actually, I have one trip to making life a little easier. We've, we've a person who comes in every day, everywhere I live. Um, does not for a not very long time, but just to uh, do cooking prep. So I have glass jars in the fridge with chopped peppers, chopped cilantro, chopped onions, slice this and julienne that so I can cook very quickly. Excellent idea. It really is. I've been, um, I was talking about it at the Global Wellness Summit and a lot of women came up to me and guys came up to me and said, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. Yeah. Because because it means if you if you come in at seven, you have dinner on the table, you know, and at seven fifteen. <laughs> yes. yes, the hardest part about cooking is the prep, you know, yes. for sure. And I don't enjoy the prep. I one of my I've I've had a life full of accidents and dramas, health dramas. Yeah. One of my accidents was when I was three in Moitura. I went down to to look for Mrs. Keedy's rhubarb pie. And I slammed the, the door, my, my thumb in the door. And so I'm missing a, 
a honk of my right thumb, so it, it makes me a bit clumsy. So oh. I'm not brilliant at prep. <laughs> oh, wow. You were so young. You were only three. Ay, ay, ay. Oh, I've had endless accidents. Oh, goodness me. But I, I was reading the other day that Librans are particularly accident prone. That's so interesting. Is that true? It seems to be. I seem to have broken every bone in my body, you know. Goodness, I wonder why. I wonder why that is. And what do you mind me asking is your husband's star sign? He's a Taurus. Oh, the bull. Yeah. And is he a typical Taurian? Absolutely. <laughs> Extremely creative. Great. Um, and very bullish. <laughs> very, yeah. very, very, very rarely gets angry. And when he does on a scale. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. But and rarely. you're there and you're there to keep the balance and Yeah, exactly. But I think Librans always see things uh, like in a three sixty kind of way. They 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 see every argument from every corner of the table. It's very it's one of the things that drives them mad. <laughs> no. Yeah, it Listen, is. Oh, Henry said, "There's two sides to every question. Let us look, <laughs> first look at the other, and that is so Libra." <laughs> no. It is. It is. Well, you're an air sign, of course. So, yeah, yeah you're, you're always you're, you're more intellectual. You're always kind of looking at the backstory and every other angle around every subject. It's interesting. Yeah, it is, yes. and constantly, constantly, uh, I'm constantly uh, researching, researching health, wellness. I mean, I have a, a bookshelf, but a three foot, a meter, sorry, for you. Um, I've been studying and living by a little bit the uh, work of the medical medium. I don't know if you've heard of Anthony William. No, that sounds really interesting. Anthony William, anyway, is well worth looking up. But uh, okay, because what is uh, studying and then finding how I can apply it to to my work. I yes. can these wellness tenets to and well being tenets to my work. A medical medium, how wonderful. Yeah, the other medical me- medium, Anthony William. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah, you know, I, we forget so many of our senses. You know, we're we're um, yes. where our senses are deadened, as I say, by IT. But the sense yeah. of touch, and we were talking about sound. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. taste mm-hmm. and smell, and you know, I work with essential oils, and you know, and, and and I use myself as a guinea pig. Do you? Yeah, if it works for me, then then I know it'll probably work for others. And do you believe in reincarnation? I do actually, because I've been in countries where I and I I have felt I've been there before, and I've also seen things which are again beyond the physical. Like you feel like you've just really been there before, or or yes, yeah, yeah. It just totally sits with you in a different way. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I went to I went to a lecture by by, by a monk in in Manhattan. To have you noticed this with babies? Sometimes a baby will look at you and you'll almost get a, a shock of energy. Yes. <laughs> and he said yes. that's, that's because you've known each other in previous lives, most likely. That's so amazing. I'm fascinated by all things around that subject. Well, or- when, when I, you know, I was in, in, a, in a plane the other day and it was very bumpy. And um, you're up there, you're between Earth and infinity. We have mm-hmm. no idea what infinity is. In fact, the whole idea of infinity is terrifying. Yeah. So we got our little planet. In fact, when I first heard about gravity and at, uh, when I was at school, I was still quite young. I was about eight, I think, or nine. And I'd really thought about it. And then I thought, what if gravity fails? And I was out in a meadow and suddenly I'm on my front of the meadow hanging off of the grass thinking, what if gravity fails? And I fly out into it. <laughs> but that, that's a typical Libran thought. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> That is a very typical Libra thought. That's so fun. That's wonderful. No, but definitely you're right about that. And sometimes I feel like when I'm in an airplane that the most like crazy, but some of the best ideas come to me. And I don't know why that is. I don't know why if it's because we, of find, that. we find that too. If I one of my team with me. We're, yeah. we're working away, and then they, they start making the landing noises, and I say to them, "Go up and tell the pilot to go around three or more, three more times." <laughs> and get the last thing result. Totally. totally. I don't know why that is, and the same thing happens to me when I'm in water. If I'm in water, yeah. really, really, it's like I'm an open channel. Like all these wonderful thoughts and ideas come to me. Like problem solving is really easy for me if I'm in either of those areas. Yeah, problem solving in airplanes, particularly. Well, you're in, you're in a capsule, really. Yeah, you are. 
You are. I don't know why that is, but it's maybe because I can't look at my mobile phone. It could be that too, you know. It could be. Oh, unfortunately, you can look at your mobile phone. You can, you can. Yeah, that's true. Depends on the airline, of course, and where you're sitting on the plane. But yeah, that's all true. So how do you unwind in the evenings or at the weekends? At the weekend or evening? I love funny movies. I love to laugh. In fact, I've been to laughter yoga. I don't know if you've ever heard of I it. I have. I've heard of laughter yoga. Dr. Must Kataria, Dr. Madan Kataria. Mm-hmm. So I love to laugh. So last night I binged on a dreadful series of <laughs> Kirby or Enthusiasm. Oh, really? Any and, good? Oh, it's very funny. He's, he's so awful that he's, funny. he's so politically incorrect. It's really funny. Pushing <laughs> and laughing at the same time. I'm going to write that down. That sounds yeah. like Curb your something enthusiasm. I need to see. Yes. So, Curb your enthusiasm. I love, and, I love funny movies. And, you know, I, yes. I, I love to read. I love to cook. I really love to cook. And uh, I love to talk. Yeah. You like to communicate. And, and as somebody once said, sometimes the best thing to do is nothing at all. Do you, do you find that hard to do, to do nothing at all? Yeah, because um, when you're doing nothing at all, that's when you start channeling and stuff comes in. (laughs) Yeah. But it's usually good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's really important to kind of switch off. I know everyone says that, but it really, really is. Um, Even for like an hour a day, if you can just give your body that time just to. Yeah, exactly. To just have some downtime. I have to confess that um, I was once asked in front of my husband uh, what my character is like. And I thought about it and I said, a sensitive army tank, <laughs> Libra Capricorn, right? And uh, my husband looked down and said, not always that sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you would be, you would, you would know. I think you would have, you would, as you said at the top of, of our, our chat, that you're very observant. Yes, I am. So you kind of know how far you can push and you know where you can pull. Yeah. You'd, you'd be sensitive, I'd imagine to all those things and then the you know and i'm working on it working on a new book i have three books i've, I've given birth to three books oh right it's like uh I'm, there's, there's there's a term they use i don't know if you've heard it laying square eggs no but i love it yeah, but, uh, writing a book for me is like laying a square egg oh. <laughs> except it's a rectangular egg with steven Morris. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's tough. That that must be painful. I'd imagine that could be yeah, yeah torturous exactly. at times. But what an achievement! Good for you. But also, I'm looking at thinking about Ireland as well. Ireland came to um, Connecticut. You know, with the you know, I worked on the Irish Hunger Museum there. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's uh, so. Uh, you were asking me what I like to work on. I think it's the answer is everything. I'm very diverse. It's, it's each thing is a new challenge. And here's a question for you: How does social media fit into your life? Oh, it's very strong in my life. Social media is very strong. I think it's is a it? wonderful way to communicate. Okay. And also, a, a wonderful way to browse. I've got found some of the best artists through social media. You know. Yeah. Books, all sorts of things. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's opened up the world. I mean, I I don't like it when it's used in a restaurant unless you're on your own. <laughs> no, but um, it's very nice to get a picture from from somebody on you know on on a beach in some foreign country, you know, somebody you know, and, and just share that moment with them for a second or two. Yeah, that's so true, and it's yeah. really kind of connected everybody in a nice yes. you know, different new way. Yeah, for sure. It has many positives, and it's like it's like COVID. It's it's um, it's democratic. Practically everybody has it. Practically everybody has it. Isn't ain't that the truth? Your your um, your small your small child will, will probably be demanding one soon. Just watch out. Oh, I know. Well, she's already watching my phone. Um, <laughs> no, no. And and look and following me around the house to see where I put the phone down or like it's just a fascination for her really. But you know, unfortunately. It's it's going to be part of her future. I have yeah, no doubt right. about that. No, I wish they could give us implants, actually, so we didn't have to carry things around. Yeah, there's an idea. I'd have to think about that a little bit more. But yeah, God knows what the future holds. Yeah. So what do you think you're going to come back as in your next life? I think probably um, either an artist or um, an architect designer. Or yes. maybe a healer could be. 
or maybe a healer. Because also, I don't know if you know, we we, um, we work with educating children in, in um, Kenya mm-hmm. the last 20 years, you know, and, and uh, education and healing are two very strong subjects in my life. So we have uh, been working on that for 20 years now, between our 20th anniversary, I think, this year. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. We've got about 1,700 kids of pastoral nomads who have uh, illiterate parents. Wow. I think making 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 a change, you know, something where I somewhere something some coming back as some person who could make a big change, mm-hmm. a big a big a big change would be nice. But I think you're a bit of a healer already, Clara, from the sounds of it. I think you're already doing that in this lifetime. Well, certainly from from uh, from from the work we're doing, it's is it is, is balancing and healing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what one piece in your home holds the most special memories for you? Photographs, a couple of photographs of my family. I have one on my desk right now. I'm looking at it, my, and then three kids sitting in Spain on stone steps. Oh, that's sweet. I have my stone Buddha in the office who's who's monitoring me, keeping you steady. Yeah, exactly. So, here's a question for you. If you were having a dinner party and you could only invite three people, either dead or alive, who would they be? Three people? Yes. Um, Oscar Wilde, Tad Orlando, and uh, let me think, maybe, maybe Larry David as the comedian. <laughs> oh, Larry David. Yeah, that's curb your enthusiasm. <laughs> Because I know the dinner party would be very funny then. Or the Dalai Lama wouldn't be a bad choice either, because he's very funny. Yeah, there you go. Good, good. Tato Ando, Ando is the, the architect I'm, I, I really most admire because because his simplicity of his work, you know, the museums are amazing. Yeah, so he would be... Yeah. He'd be one that you would invite. If you could invite a fourth, he'd be, or say if Oscar cancelled, you'd invite him. Exactly. <laughs> and Oscar, knowing Oscar, would pro- be probably quite likely to uh, cancel. I, when I was a little, when I was 11, my brother gave me a book called The Epigrams of Oscar Wilde. Yeah. And uh, so I grew up with his epi- epigrams. I collect quotes, actually. I'm very interested in how words influence my life and influence my design. I have Mm -hmm. a key wall in the studio, a chalkboard wall, where my favorite quotes are on it. How wonderful. That's really interesting. And did you know that Oscar Wilde was a Libra? Yes, of course. (laughs) (laughs) That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So what advice would you give to your younger self? To my younger self? Um... Hard to say, really, because it's. Uh, I was so ignorant, you know. But I, I'm not sure what learning would have brought me. Yes, it's almost like you went into the world and you just learned as you went along. Exactly. And that's probably the best thing that ever happened to you. As I say, I think it probably is because I, since I don't know what the rules are, always I can't break them, or I don't know I'm breaking them. <laughs> that's such. That's such a great. That's such a great quote. And where do you see yourself in the next five or even ten years? I, I see myself continuing to, to work. Um, I see myself as an orchestra conductor in a sense, conducting the project and bringing all the in the like the woodwind and the percussion and so on. You know, yes, chamber music. In case if it's a home, a little less, a little less flamboyant. I could see myself doing that. Um, I'd like to. I have some ideas for helping people, which I'm trying to get get some very, very, very rich person to not rich, powerful person to help me to to um, get my ideas out. But you're brave. That's I think what I what I definitely learned about you today is that you're just so brave and you've experienced so much and nothing really knocks you down. You just keep going. Well, I think my childhood set me up for that. And I think I think that, um, and I I often say I once I've only one speed fast forward, you know, at the moment and fast forward uh, because what what is they say that your what is the body the body is the keeper of all your memories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about getting up in the morning. I have one ritual, you know, that that, that I always do. Um, it's it's based on a Hopi Indian quote, which I actually put on the wall of a spa in uh, Tucson. Um, open the door and take a breath of the new dawn and make it part of you. 
Oh, that's nice. It is nice, yeah. Yeah, the, that's good. Or I take a deep breath. Yeah, that's nice. I think learning to accept the energy that's there for us, this huge energy that's there for us. And I think in my next life, I'd like to learn how to channel it better. Yes, but I think you've done a very good job of channeling it in this lifetime. And I think you've helped many people. You've inspired so many people. I even have the even the traces of my fashion, did you know, is going into the National Museum of Ireland. I have no doubt that it is. I mean, I have some vintage garments. That's, that's how cool is that? Your client left me. How wonderful. And have you seen them? Like, have you gone back and held them and looked at them in the way that you designed them? And, have, and they try them on in, in the studio and they like them. <laughs> no, no. I know, but what's that moment like when you're looking at your, you know, the garments that you once were handling and designing? Well, you know, I'm a Libra. Yes, I so you're very critical of your own work. That better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but it's it must be like the most awesome experience to just stand there and 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 hold that piece and kind of transport your mind back to the time it when is, you made it that. It is actually, but it's um. You were asking about my character, I think, at one point. Yes. And uh, when I left boarding school, there was one really beautiful woman there, very calm, very beautiful, with that kind of that fat blonde hair and a big braid, you know. And I was walking down the street about a year after I left left school. And I was walking down the street in Dublin, and I, and we ran into each other. And I said, oh, it's lovely to see you, you know, that you're so great. I was saying, you know, you, you were so calm, you know, and all the dramas and... I said, do you remember anything about me? And she said, yes, testy perfectionist. There you go. (laughs) So do you think that you can be hard on yourself? Yes. Yeah. And is that from your childhood? There's more. There's more. Well, my father was very critical of us also. Yeah. Treated us like we're 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 dogs and horses. You know, pretty pretty didn't get that eye, the eyes from that side of the family. And, you know. Yes. (laughs) And also, I told you, he he had our career set out for us. It's uh, it's like that you know you grew up with very kind of high standards around you and expectations of you and as you said your dad kind of you know had designed all of your careers for you before you could even probably walk or talk yeah probably you know and then you were thrusted off a horse and you were li- literally thrown into the future of something completely different to what was mapped out for you yeah exactly and what seemed like a tragedy was one of the best things that could have ever happened to you and what was interesting actually. Actually, he kicked me out of the house, but but I did a show in the uh, Hibernian Hotel, which was then open for um, the Irish Cancer Society, my first fashion show, public fashion show, mm-hmm. and published in the, in the Irish Times, and I was allowed back in to the house. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. And do you think he regretted, you know, his decision at the time, do you think? No. There's, no. He, no, right. He was a tough cookie. Well, the, the way he was brought up, you know. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Your poor mom. That must have been hard for her, too. Yeah, because she had a beautiful childhood and, you know, she was very brave. I mean, imagine riding cross country on si- sitting side saddle. Definitely. Races. I mean, goodness. Yeah, she sounds incredible as well. But she was uh, very quiet when I met her. Oh, was she? Yeah, yeah, very. You know, she 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 had lost all that. It was a surprise to me when she told me she'd ridden cross country sites yes. races. You know, and about yes, 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 her yes. art show and everything came out very slowly. And why do you think she was so quiet? Well, I think I think that um, as I said, there was a huge scandal. I think she had her light put out a bit. Yeah, her spirit might have been broken a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Gosh, you are just so interesting. I think I think there needs to be a movie uh, about you and your life. To be honest, <laughs> is there not enough with three documentaries now? <laughs> so when is the documentary coming out on RTE? I cannot wait to see it. I I don't know. I think they're editing it now. Oh my gosh. This won't take long. This is quick, but it's called the quick fire round of questions where I just ask you one or the other and you have to pick one of the two options I give you, if you like. Okay. Tea or coffee? Depends on the mood. Bath or shower? Uh, Both. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Hot or cold shower? Uh, Both. New York or Ireland? Both. (laughs) (laughs) Text or talk? Uh, Talk over text. City or country living? Both. Red or white wine? Both. 
Uh, people or places? Both. <laughs> I'm a Libra. You are a true Libra. Uh, fiction or nonfiction? Both. Sin or virtue? Depends on the mood. Home or abroad? Both. Interior design or architecture? Both. Site visits or office meetings? Again, both. Wet sponge or dry sponge? I like the wet sponge. Got that I've got information. Curating or creating? Both. Oscar Wilde or the Dalai Lama? Oh, both. (laughs) (laughs) Well... You have been, I have to say, one of the first guests that has answered both to 90, well, 99% of the questions asked. So (laughs) that's that's a first. So (laughs) thank you, Claude. (laughs) But look, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. And I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you. And I have to have to tell you something, you know, shut the front door. It's so funny because um, in Ireland, when I was living in Ireland and all the houses, the shunt front door was always shut except for um just difficult things and the back door was always open yeah there you go so shut the front door with coda there you go (laughs) so take care and thank you thank you for inviting me you're very very welcome we've we've been honored to have you as a guest